The Leadership Show with Andy Peck. It's super to have your company on The Leadership Show. My great joy to host conversations with leaders and experts on leadership themes. The aim, of course, is to help leaders lead better and help those without a leadership title realise that God has plans for them in influencing others for his purposes. It's great, too, to be back to more current interviews after a period using archives. This week, we're looking at one of the great challenges of our day, certainly in the UK and perhaps in the part of the world where you're listening to this from. As you look at the church you attend, I wonder, what do you see? Is it mostly grey and white-haired people or a mix of old and young? If you think of your church 20 years from now, would you imagine that it might still be healthy or is it likely to have closed its doors if nothing changes? Alongside declining attendance in the UK is declining numbers of youth attending. 75% of Church of England churches have fewer than five under 16s in church on an average Sunday. Now, of course, this doesn't account for the excellent work done at other times and with other charities, but most denominational heads have realised that this is the challenge facing them, as many of their local churches face very few young people and children in their church at all. Well, I'm joined this week on The Leadership Show by Tim Goff, who has served as a youth worker in a local church and is now pioneer director of YFC Tlandudno in North Wales. He's the author of Rebooted and he's currently engaged in a research degree. I look forward to learning his perspective on this issue. What have we got to this point and what might we do to put it right? God helping us. So, Tim, great to have you on the Leadership Show. From our introduction, we've talked a little bit about the, the challenge that will be facing many local churches. But obviously, there'll be many local church leaders listening who think, what problem are children and youth is going quite well? So perhaps you could kind of paint a global picture. You've been involved in a local church uh, leadership as a, a youth pastor, but also as a, part of a national movement, Youth for Christ. Give us your perspective over your ministry thus far no thank you um a global pitch is quite tricky but certainly in the uk um looking at the statistics there's only really one in four churches working with young people like intentionally giving youth provision for anyone under 18. at that point you go well it's great that there are some churches out there good resourcing big churches doing great youth work but there's so many more that have absolutely nothing for young people at all it's not so young people aren't welcome there but there's no intentional outreach or discipleship among young people and that's 75 percent. that's most churches in the uk obviously this is on the back of the decline in church attendance that's uh, taken place well within the last generation of course and i guess many local churches have kind of grown old together and so as as young people have drifted away it's become harder and harder for for people to attract any young people that would be part of the issue would you say i think so i think we've seen significant declines since the late 1940s i think since world war ii you know increasing creeping secularism has drawn people away from church but at the same time there's been a, a segregation within church itself so even when youth work's been done really well which we have been doing since the 1950s that youth work has been largely separate to the life of the church um, in the mid 80s, someone talked about the one eared Mickey Mouse as an image of Mickey Mouse's face being the church and then one of its ears being the youth work. <laughs> and even, you know, even without decline, that's still a problem because the more you, uh, you know, for want of a better way of putting it, the more you lop limbs off a body, the less healthy the entire body is going to be. And I think we have systematically and uh, institutionally over the last 50 years. T you know, drawn the, the body of Christ apart by putting youth and children in separate boxes to quote unquote main church. Well, let's talk a little bit about the kind of models that have existed over this time and maybe the extent to which, maybe from a leadership angle, they've worked and not worked and maybe 
causing part of the problem, given, of course, that there's a, a general decline. The magazine I also helped to edit youth and children's work obviously started as a youth work magazine, which was coming off the back of high investment in uh, youth leaders that took place uh, 70s, 80s, I guess, um, 90s to some extent, um, where things seemed to be much more buoyant. Um, and that seemed to be uh, answering many adults' questions of crumbs. How can we help our children who are growing into the teenage years? And it's a frightening time for us. Uh, how can we keep them? Let's get a trendy youth worker to to come and and look after things. Well, I'd, I'd almost push back a little bit and say that's really a, a, the 1990s. Um, I mean, the mid 70s to the late 80s had an emergence of several youth ministry types, but it wasn't until the early 90s where you had the. Uh, there was a main stream thing to do was to hire a church youth worker. You had youth work festivals, youth work conferences. Uh, more youth work resources being published at that time. The youth work boon was really the 1990s. And um, and since then, we've been, I think, in decline. And it was encouraging, I think, for a lot of uh, leaders at the time to see, you know, lots of youth work happening. But again, it was happening in very separate spaces. And the question has got to be, OK, what happened to those many, many young people who connected with youth workers in the 90s? And where are they now? And of course, some of them still going on following the Lord. Some of them became pastors and youth pastors themselves. But it feels, in terms of bang for book, that we lost a lot of young people at that time. And there's the yeah, the stats we probably know that if you don't accept Jesus by the time you turn really 14, there's only about a 9% chance you ever will. Um, but there's another question you to be asked at that point. Which is, if you accept Jesus at your 14, you want to keep following him past 18. Um, and you have to sow the seeds of a resilient faith early in that process. I'm not sure youth work's been well equipped for that for quite a while. I think some of the declines come off the back of very successful youth work, but didn't have very successful you know, young adult follow-up. I've seen stats from the United States, which suggest that the number of people continuing with their faith beyond the age of 18 is around about 50%. Um, apparently, those stats improve dependent on the parenting of those children so if parents are, are deeply committed to the faith and work hard on the discipleship the stats go up to about 80 percent and again i appreciate these are you know, kind of random surveys at one level but would that be the kind of feel that you've had in in youth work that you've as you've as you've analyzed people dropping off yeah i think very successful youth workers are integrated into schools integrated into church integrated to families um, the families one is often the more difficult one because families have such a huge variety of shapes and um, there's no such thing as a typical family. Um, and often the family models of ministry that have worked very well have only really worked well for traditional nuclear families. And so one of the challenges youth workers and leaders are going to have to face the next 15, 20 years is how do we really engage blended families, single parent families, no parent families, big brother families, you know, there's all sorts of um, families based ministry that isn't being done by the youth worker, often because youth workers just aren't equipped for it. Um, I think that's one of the significant areas that if we want to see youth work and church restored to health that we're going to have to work really hard at. Okay. Talking also about the parachurch ministry which uh, you're part of yfc which is dates from the 1950s i believe yeah late late 40s early 50s in the uk okay sure so there've been the and lo lots to be grateful for in terms of yfc and other youth ministries that have grown up in that patch since yfc started um obviously some people will say hey that's been part of the problem that it's not been local church focused enough therefore um Young people have drifted away from local church because it's, you know, it's not as as exciting as the youth ministry that that, that found them and that did their early discipleship. Uh, you must have heard that comment. What, how would you respond to it? Um, it's a yes and a no. It's a, it's a both and, isn't it? I mean, yes, um, particularly Young Life and Youth for Christ in the States and the in the fifties. Uh, formed a very particular type of youth work that was separate to the church, and then was picked up on by churches hiring youth workers. And a lot of youth workers were born in that 
you know, were, were raised in that, um, that style of youth work and so continued to do youth work that was separate to the church, even if they were part of churches. And parachurch has got a lot to, I think it has a lot of, uh, blame's not the right word, but so it had a lot of influence in that model. But the other side of that, parachurch, if, and ugly as a word as it is, if parachurch is done well, it's a wonderful champion of church unity. Um, often churches will get together over young people's work when they won't get together over anything else. And often, especially having more recent last decade and a half, you've seen parachurch being the instigator of that level of unity, that level of, of church together events, church together projects, church together follow up. And often it's been a parachurch worker that's instigated that. During the, the, the period we've been talking about, I think a lot of Christian parents would say that it seems to be much harder to help young people to take faith and church seriously because of alternative attractions. Um, obviously, we're within that period, the relaxation, relaxation of, of, of what you could do on a Sunday has changed. There's a greater competition with sport on Sundays that seems to have grown up. Um, would that partly account for some of these issues or do you think that's a bit of a red herring? I don't know, I go back and forth on this. There's certainly a lot of competition, but you don't need an awful lot to compete with church. Yeah, <laughs> You don't need 15 things on, you need one thing. And the only thing the devil needs us to do is not believe in Jesus. One distraction is often enough. And I think really what it comes down to, well, well, I'll put it this way. I feel sometimes church can blame the world for what we do badly. It's not secularism's fault that people aren't hearing the gospel, it's our fault. And I think if we restore confidence in the gospel, restore confidence in Jesus, restore our ability to, to preach Jesus well and clearly in relevant and healthy ways, those distractions won't matter. It's about finding Jesus' work in the real world. And I think if we're doing our job well, um, it, it shouldn't matter as much as we think it does that there's other things that could tempt people away. Well, as it were, moving away from the paralysis of analysis, uh, Tim. Let's talk a little bit about the landscape as it exists now um, in terms of the, the approach to youth work and uh, the training of youth workers, the use of volunteers, and uh, the, the whole challenge of the, the local church going forward with um, some stats suggest maybe early 90s percentage of young people having no connection with the local church, uh, script union, uses the 95% percent rule, uh, whether, whether that's right or not. Uh, there's still significant numbers of young people not connecting, and there's significant numbers of local churches not doing any youth work. So um, I'm not going to say what is the solution, Tim, but I am saying, so what are the leadership challenges that we're facing at the moment in terms of the training of, of children, youth, family workers, and the, the, the focus on, on a future that's if we're not careful, is going to have very few young yeah. people in it. Well, let me just, let's just lay the landscape down. There's, I think, only 11 Bible colleges in the UK that offer a, a youth work specialism in their degree courses. Okay. Um, plenty have blended their youth work with children and family or, or system ministry, or whatever else it might be, or practical theology. So the youth work specialism has been slowly vanishing. And of course, youth work training centers are closing down altogether as well. So there's less options to go and train. Um, the statistics that suggest that the number of youth work student intake has dropped by half in a decade. Um, so we just don't have that many youth work students in training. I think there's um, something like 70 or 75 youth workers in training today at a recognized JNC, uh, you know, a recognized youth work qualification college in a Christian setting. Um, so the workforce isn't being trained. Um, but also churches will say that when they're trying to hire youth workers, the applicants aren't coming in. Um, they'll have a, a reasonably attractive salary and a package and still they're not getting the, the competition they need for applicants. So if there is a sense of, you know, the laborers are few. Um, that said, most of the youth work in the UK, most being at least 70%, is done by volunteers. And I think that gives us an enormous opportunity rather than as much as I want to invest in the future of youth work training, and it's absolutely vital that we do, there's an opportunity to invest in facilitators rather than leaders. Rather than hiring a superstar youth worker to come in and be the white knight for a couple of years, burn out and quit, um, to hire people who've come with the skills and the gifts and the passions and to train them accordingly to raise up volunteers. 
to really empower a volunteer workforce because that's where most of the work's being done anyway. And I think it'd be great to see two big changes in youth work training, one being train your youth workers not just to do youth work, but to do conflict resolution, uh, mediation, leading people who are older than them, those sorts of things. And the second one is add youth work as a, uh, a compulsory module to all Bible college courses. Whatever you're trained in as a vicar or a curate or a missionary, I think youth work should be a significant part of your training. Sarah Holmes recent research um, of something like 207 church leaders uh, suggested many clergy uh, and other church leaders felt ill-equipped to connect with the with children within their congregation or whatever which suggests the, the comment you've just made is probably very apposite you know that that actually you need to have a warmth and a heart for this kind of ministry, uh, or at least an understanding of it so that you can support others in it. Yeah, I think youth work is that boogeyman, isn't it? It's the, oh gosh, I can't work with teenagers. They're, they're, they're terrifying and they'll, they'll, they'll bite me or something. And I think the reality is young people is as different from each other as any type of people are from each other. There's not one type of young person. I think the Gen Z myth really is a myth. I think Gen Z is a broad swath of some traits that are common to this generation but really all young people are different mm -hmm. and they need a variety of people to speak into their lives and um, there was another I think myth a few years ago that did the rounds and a lot of the research which was young people are looking for a parent figure from their youth worker I don't think that's true I think young people are looking for a family and church can be a family a youth worker can't be a parent figure there's all kinds of things awkward about that but a youth worker can facilitate a church to be a family to a young person. And, you know, the varieties of young people, the varieties of people in church, I think there's a, a match, some matchmaking to be done here that we're not pursuing with enough vigour at the moment. One of the other apparent solutions had been to appoint children's workers, so to start a bit um, earlier, to invest not just in youth but in children, and perhaps more latterly, to have family workers who can, and we you know, alluded to that in our conversation already. Um, any thoughts on, on that as an approach? I'm a big fan in hiring specialists. I think as long as the specialists don't see their job to be to do all the thing within their specialism, hire a children's worker to raise up volunteer children's workers not to do all the children's worker the work, mm -hmm. to hire a youth worker not to do all the youth work, a family's worker not to do all the family's work. And I think we are moving to a place now where intergenerational ministry is becoming more mainstream. And I think there is a more, there's a growing understanding about the need to do things together. I think it's great to hire specialists, but as long as they are feeding into the, the vibrant worshipping community, not just going off and doing something in their corner. Perhaps we can um, turn particularly to, to, to uh, detached youth work or to work in schools and that kind of thing. Uh, manifestly, given the, the low percentage of young people in local church, um, the focus on, on, on helping the, quote, secular young person to connect with God at all is going to be important. Perhaps you could paint a little bit of a picture of, f for some listeners perhaps who are unaware of this, particularly if they've got, you know, offspring who are, have been enculturated in this church, what it's like for a young person today who's observing the local church or, or not and, and what they're making of it all. Well, I think young people are so many generations removed now from church being a normal part of their life. Even their grandparents' parents don't necessarily have a church connection anymore. It used to be that, our oh, mum sent me to church. And then maybe after that it was, well, my mum was sent to church, and before that it was well, my mum's grandma. Yeah, my mum's. I think we're so many generations removed from that now that church is just another part of the, the spiritual landscape of Britain. It's one of many options. As I was mentioning, schools work. This is where the, the Christian specialist youth worker comes alive because they can go into school, uh, they can be part of the curriculum, be part of the enrichment programs, be part of, um, of student support, be part of mentoring, and actively show the distinct ways in which the love of Jesus is different. Um, it's not about another building of another place of worship with another holy book and another set of rituals. It's about a living and active relationship with Jesus. And that can be lived out in school's work in a way it's very difficult to do if all that you're trying to is attract young people invitationally to come into the local church. 
But young people are going to have some sort of education in, in RE, are, are they not? So there will be something going on, obviously often taught by um, percentage-wise, there are you know, not necessarily Christian in, in those teaching that RE. And, and the curriculum now is so broad, you can certainly do a RE GCSC and not talk about Christianity. Um, and if you do talk about Christianity, you're more likely to talk about the rituals and religious practices of some Christians than you are to talk about the realities of faith. And so even if they have a, an understanding of the mechanism, it might not have an understanding of what really makes Christianity tick. So uh, impossible question, Tim, as we come towards close. You've, you've got a, a spiritual magic wand uh, <laughs> and you can you can influence denominational heads and leaders um, that's going to help to resolve and solve our is our, the issue of young people leaving and uh, you know the, the the vast swathes of young people not even being aware there's a, a God in heaven who loves them. So what would be the kind of things that you'd want to say see as – uh, priorities in, in in your kind of answer to this issue? Yeah, I, a couple of things I could say. Um, you for Christ at the moment, we're talking an awful lot about restoring confidence in the gospel. And I'm, I'm looking for a generation of church leaders and particularly youth leaders who can clearly articulate all the moving parts of the gospel well. I think that's essential and I would love to put that front and centre. But more practically speaking, I would love for the church leaders of the UK as much as possible to get in one room and to ask the question, what could we do to bring the body back into true coherence? What does it look like for young people, children, families, adults, third age, to truly be together as a worshiping body? Not just multi-faith, no, sorry, not just um, intergenerational or multi-generational um, services or moral age services. What would it look like for the main time, main sense of worship to be attended across the age spectrum? How do we bring the body back into you know, true coherence? So Tim, as we come to a close, uh, you know, so, some folk have maybe found their interest peaked on this whole area. Um, and we've, we've touched on lots of things. What would be some books or resources that people could go to, particularly church leaders, maybe who've, who are facing the issue of crumbs, we've got no young people in our church, or um, we seem to be not doing very well. What would, where would you oh. we'd suggest they went? Lovely. And you, and you've written yourself, so feel free to share your own book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I did. I wrote a book called Rebooted, which is all about how do we develop a more biblical model of youth ministry. Um, I'd love people to read that if they find it helpful. Um, a couple more I'd, I'd point out. I think Martin Saunders' Youth Work from Scratch is still a great book to pick up if you're still thinking how do we do this from stage one, day one, without any resources. Uh, and a newer book, which I'd really um, plug, would be Andy Defoe's um, Looking Good Naked. It's a really awkward book to Google. <laughs> but look it on Amazon, you'll be fine. So what's the name again of the author? Uh, Andy Defoe. He's, um, Andy Defoe. He's oh, yes. the Morland's College. D-E-F-E-U. That's right. F-E-U. F-E-U. And Andy, if you listen to this, I pronounce your name wrong. I'm very <laughs> sorry, because I do. Um, but he wrote a book really thinking about youth ecclesiology what was it what would it look like um to move away from the the superhero youth worker model and to restore our faith in the church as the primary agent of youth work delivery and i'd really recommend people would read that excellent uh, so tim well thank you for all that you've shared um it's it's a big challenge but it is one of the key leadership challenges that the UK church is facing at the moment if if there is to be a next generation of the church. So thank you for uh, your insights and, um, and and for your experience in this field. And uh, may God bless, you know, your future ministry in uh, Thlandidno and, um, uh, and whatever God has for you. Lovely. Thank you very much. It was a joy. It was a great joy to chat with Tim Goff and to gain his perspective on this vital challenge for us. He mentioned some books, including his own, his book, Tim Goff, Rebooted, Reclaiming Youth Ministry for the Long Haul, a Biblical Framework. He recommended two books, one by Martin Saunders, Youth Work from Scratch, How to Launch or Revitalize a Church Youth Ministry, and Andy Defoe, Looking Good Naked, colon, Youth Work, and the body of Christ. And Andy Defoe's surname is lowercase d-u, new word f-e-u, foe. 
These are great books if you want to get started or want to think more about this particular theme. This is a tough issue, and it may not be your issue, but hopefully it's someone's issue in your local church. So maybe encourage them to listen to this. At the very least, maybe pray about it and ask God for direction. Maybe you have a long-term plan of how you can revitalize your children and youth ministry. Maybe you need to involve a charity that has expertise in this to come and help you. Premier has developed uh, a new website for Christian parents and youth and children's workers. It's called Premier Next Gen. That's N-E-X-G-E-N dot com. Uh, you can access the youth and children's ministry resources there for less than a pound a week. Uh, and you can access the Christian parenting material absolutely free if you register. Thanks again for joining me, and I look forward to connecting again next week. This is Andy Peck, your host, reminding you that we serve a God who is powerful and a God of adventure. He's right there for you, whatever you're facing right now. Trust him. The Leadership Show with Andy Peck. To get in touch, email andy.peck at premier.org.uk. L is yep, for the way that's who you think it is. The Grimace Mug. The Hello Kitty keychain. Barbie herself. For a limited time, your favorite McDonald's collectibles filled with memories and magic are now on Collectible Cups. Get one of six when you order a collector's meal at McDonald's with your choice of a Big Mac or 10-piece McNuggets. Come get your cup while you still can. I participate in McDonald's for a limited time while supplies last.